fact, in the Los Angeles area alone, 10 metric tons of plastic fragments, that's things like grocery bags, straws, soda bottles, are carried into the Pacific Ocean every day. That's 10 metric tons every day. And that's just in Los Angeles. The average American throws away approximately 185 pounds of plastic per year. Enough plastic is thrown away each year to circle the earth four times. And it can take anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years for plastic to degrade. When Hamilton Perkins, the founder of, well, Hamilton Perkins, learned about some of these facts, he decided not to just sit around and say, oh, that's pretty terrible. Somebody should do something about that. He decided to actually do something about that. He started a company that makes amazing, functional, and stylish bags out of recycled plastic. And not only that, they're ethically made and providing economic opportunity for people in developing nations. Hamilton Perkins is a business owner that, honestly, I wish more people were like. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of stillbeingmolly.com, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just all around amazing person who's trying to make a positive impact not only through their personal life, but also with their professional career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact right where you are. Now on to this week's episode and enjoy my conversation with Hamilton Perkins. Hey, Hamilton, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on, Molly. I am so excited to have you on. If if our conversation today on this show is as fun as the brief five-minute conversation we just had before we started recording, <laughs> I'm really going to look forward to this. Or I don't know. Absolutely. I, I'm going to enjoy this. It's going to be awesome. Um, Hamilton, it is uh, such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I'm so excited for you to share your story and um, how you got started in uh, – creating Hamilton Perkins and um, all of that. So, but before we get there, we have to learn the Hamilton 101. So give us your story. Tell us about yourself, who you are, what you do, and what it is that you have gone through or done to get you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I started as a marketing major at Old Dominion University. I uh, didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I actually, uh, my, I, I spent a short amount of time in the sports management uh, program. I've always had a, a love for sports. Mm. Uh, but I quickly found out that I would be more interested in business. And uh, I would eventually go on to graduate where I, I moved to D.C. for a short, short period. Uh, worked in uh, Georgetown and, you know, just kind of got my feet wet there. And, you know, I learned that, you know, I was interested more in like economics and finance. Um, eventually I, I joined a bank so that I could learn, uh, more at a bird's eye view. And, you know, eventually, uh, I, I had always been in retail though. I, mm -hmm. I, before I started, uh, kind of like my college career, I, you know, even back in like high school, middle school, you know, I had an eBay store and then, you know, I, I my first business was a locker decoration business. So That's I made, awesome. Uh, <laughs> I made, uh, these, these locker decorations out of, uh, magazine posters. So I, I would sell those for like a buck a page, you know, and, uh, my school eventually shut down my business. And, uh, <laughs> but that just kind of like traces back to like my roots, I guess, of being, uh, entre entrepreneurial spirited. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of going up, coming up to where we are now. I mean, I felt like, uh, I, I'd, al I'd already been working on a leather goods business on the side. So I was you know, kind of selling to, uh, you know, doctors, lawyers, bankers, like these custom bags that had uh, their initials on it or fraternity, uh, et cetera. And uh, it, it was a like really, it was a highly customized business. But, um, you know, going forward, I basically was learning more uh, by having access uh, at a bank. I learned more about like, you know, trash and waste like i found out there were about 30 billion plastic bottles going to be thrown away mm -hmm. uh in a particular year in the u.s and you know the average american was throwing away over 100 pounds of plastic um i also saw the outdoor advertising industry growth uh compounded annual growth rate uh was like double digits and you know with all the digital things happening and 
uh, you know, the kind of evolution of that, I'm thinking, you know, what's happening to the vinyls, you know, right. after they're done. And I'm noticing and learning that they're actually just kind of going into landfill. So yeah, we came up with this concept to make a better bag based on, you know, how could we uh, make a bag that had a purpose? How could we kind of, you know, know more about this company that's making these bags? And, you know, how could we really invite customers into that journey? And um, there wasn't really a uh, kind of a solution at the time. Uh, looked online, looked in the department stores, couldn't find it. So we decided we'd make it. Um, we ran a Kickstarter campaign. We had a $10,000 goal. We hit the goal in about a week, had a six month lead time. Uh, basically, you know, found some time to hit the business plan, uh, competition circuit here in Virginia. So we, we won a $25,000 grant from the governor of Virginia. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. We, we ended up, um, closing out the year with the trunk show at Bloomingdale's. Um, you know, so to date we've done three trunk shows at Bloomingdale's. Um, you know, I, I, left my full-time position in investment management so that I could, uh, you know, work on the venture full-time. And, um, you know, we, we started our web store in early 2017 and, you know, now we're just in the process of like building our inventory and, you know, really like servicing customers, um, you know, that are interested in our products. Yeah. Wow. There is, there's so much meat there that I want to, I want to <laughs> break down. Um, so I want to kind of go back a little bit to, when you start first started learning now i i guess i sh- i should ask this if we go back even farther as a kid did you ever find yourself were you the kid that always i mean I think it's pretty awesome that you created a locker decorating business. Um, <laughs> but were you always the kid that was sort of the entrepreneur at heart? And did you, but, and then at the same time, did you also have a high sense of sense of empathy? And, and I guess the reason I ask that is because so many people that I talk to, I talk to so many business owners and I talk to a lot of business owners in this, what we kind of call the, the, the buzzword of the ethical fashion space or the ethical goods space, the fair trade space. And almost all of them, when they really look back and they think about when they were a kid, like they were the kid that like was the one that was helping the kid on the playground who couldn't climb up the slide. Or they were the one that always sat with the kid who was by himself at the lunch table. You know, like they, they, they see sort of that pattern of wanting to do good and help people from an early stage. So I guess it's sort of a two part question. Like one, did you, did you always have that entrepreneurial drive? Like even from an, you know, did you have a lemonade stand to, you know, and did you always have just sort of that very strong sense of, um, empathy and wanting to help. Absolutely. I think I've always been really entrepreneurial. Uh, I had, I also sold candy in school. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, would hit the, you know, in the summertime, you know, I, I'd hit the neighborhood with my uh, lawnmower. I'd, you know, hit the, uh, neighborhood with my shovel. If it was, uh, winter time, yeah. you know, I, I was kind of like an all season, you know, type of, you know, entrepreneur kind of just, you know, trying to, trying to, create something like I think eventually I I did find out that um you know through like our action like through commerce like you can help people you know Mm -hmm. you can uh, have a a cause and I think um over time it took me I don't know if you just kind of learn you know that you know business was like an okay thing to do like it's not like a bad thing to be in business because you can help people and you know for a lot of the impact that business has you can attract really good talent um you know and i kind of compare it you know if you're saying you'll do a nonprofit or if say you'll you'll go into government you know if you start a company or or even if you work at a corporate uh like a big corporate like a big company Mm -hmm. you know i looked at it as if you can attract really good talent because you can really incentivize you know, particularly young people, uh, but not just young people, you know, just say smart people. You can incentivize smart people with, uh, you know, whether that's equity or, um, you know, just more upside, more action. And, you know, at the end of the day, resources, um, you can attract more capital so that you can invest in the areas that you want to improve. So if you want to, you know, you want to be an ethical brand or you want to be a do good brand, I mean, it is going to take you some capital to do that. And uh, it's going to take time and, you know, kind of just, I think it was an evolution. So I've always had the value system. I think having the actual plan to get there, yeah, that's what crystallized for me like over the years. Yeah. And I, I think that that is a great point that you made about 
if you want to be an ethical brand, you got to have capital. And I think that that is something that, I mean, obviously all businesses need money, but knowing so many people in this space, like it is really, it's hard. It's harder because you're not cutting corners like a lot of other businesses do. And you're not trying to find the absolute cheapest way to get it done because you care and and you care about the production. You care about how it's being made. You care about the impact it has on the environment. And those things cost money. Um, but I think that people forget that or, or don't realize, I guess I should say, that when you're buying a product like, you know, one of your bags that's made out of, you know, just made with intention, it's made purposefully, it's it, it's handcrafted, like, these are the types of products that are going to last. Like you're, so you might exactly. be spending a little bit more money up front, but you're not going to have to replace it in a year. Totally. I, I think from a quality perspective, you, you're going to find like, for example, with our product, like you're not losing any quality. Um, and that's the biggest thing that we had to overcome. I think coming from uh, sort of the social impact space or the ethical space, I think automatically, you know, people feel like it's discounted or like they feel like um, because it's recycled that uh, it maybe it isn't as the same, you know, standard or quality that they are used to or accustomed to from uh, maybe a brand that's like, like you said, only really focusing on like bottom line, you know, uh, maybe speed, getting the product to customers in a timely mm-hmm. manner. Um, so in our case, you know, that's, that's the challenge, but um, you know, there's early adopters, you know, there's, there's folks that, you know, are willing to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, ride the whole journey with us. And, you know, basically they share the vision with us of we want to have a future where we can see sustainable material used in, uh, you know, if not every piece, uh, definitely uh, the majority of the pieces that kind of hit hit retail stores or that are showcased online. Yeah, Absolutely. And I also want to talk a little bit about what you had mentioned when you were working, and I think you said you were working at a bank when you started to learn about trash and waste. And for people that are listening, they're like, wait, what? You're going to talk about trash and waste? Yeah. (laughs) And it's actually way more interesting than you probably think it is, because this is also something that a few years ago, I didn't really have a good perspective on. And I think it's very easy it almost becomes the epitome of the phrase out of sight, out of mind. And people are just like, well, you can just throw it away. I'm like, well, let's, let's break that down. So if you have something that you is in your hand and you no longer want it and you put it in a trash can, eventually you take out that trash and you put it in the trash can by the street or you put it in a trash, you know, a dump, like a dump, uh, whatever those things out back of a restaurant or something. (laughs) And then a trash truck comes and they pick it up. So there's a man driving that trash truck and then the or woman and then they pick up that trash and they take it to the local landfill. And then it's dumped there like and it it just for the most part just stays there forever. And it can be very easy for us to just be like, oh, yeah, throw it away. And then you you never see it again. But that doesn't mean that it's like disappeared from the universe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. I read I read somewhere that a plastic straw that you get from like McDonald's. So you're getting a cup at McDonald's and you get a plastic straw. That plastic straw doesn't break down for 200 years. And in some cases, plastic can take up to 1,000 years to degrade. It, it right. is... Uh, you know, widely kind of uh, accepted a- a- amongst, you know, theorists or ex- experts that, you know, our-, our generation will be kind of remembered as the plastic generation. That will be the thing that, like, you know, yeah. unfortunately, future generations will look back because, you know, in the last 10 years, we've made more plastic than we had in the previous 100 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, 9 billion tons of plastic. I think that's almost 25,000 times the Empire State Building weight. Mm -hmm. Um, If you look at, like you mentioned, the the equivalent of uh, the the garbage truck driver picking up trash, that's essentially what our team is. We we intersect right there. Um, We show up. We collect the vinyls. We collect the billboards. Clients will send us vinyls. So we just got a nice delivery yesterday, which we're very thankful for. Um, (laughs) We get... But, you know, we get billboard vinyls or posters, uh, concerts, wine festivals, you name it. 
and then we transform it into you know this like bold pop of color on the inside of every one of our bags That's and so in some cool. cases it's it's bold pops of color on the outside um we started with a backpack um it was a convertible backpack that was on kickstarter last summer basically this time last summer it was mm-hmm. live it was a live campaign and uh you know, now we are basically reintroducing that backpack. The backpack sold out. We sold out of our duffel bags, our backpacks, basically everything that we had. Uh, and we now have introduced apparel. So so we have shirts that are 50% plastic, 50% cotton. And, you know, we knew that we weren't going to be sort of textile experts or recycling experts overnight. So we were able to partner with Thread International uh, they're a certified B Corporation yes. and an organization in Pittsburgh that's really been doing this work for, you know, several years before we got started. You know, they had already made big time investments in Haiti and Honduras and you know several other several other countries around the world, you know, kind of like providing a solution to end poverty. And it all kind of starts with like these dignified income opportunities. So each bag we sell, each, each shirt we sell, they support dignified income opportunities, specifically in Haiti, which is our uh, pilot country. Um, I was just uh, I was just there um, last month, and you know, as you mentioned it, you know, it's really I mean, it's like this very like uh, visceral experience. I mean, to stand in the middle of a landfill, uh, you know, like we went to a landfill in the Caribbean. It was mm-hmm. uh, one of the largest in the Caribbean, where. You know, there's just like trash being burned everywhere, but there's like plastic, you know, basically all over the ground. I mean, it's it, it's just like it's nothing like anything, you know, I've ever seen. basically. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, you notice that um, the collection center owners are, you know, they're there and they're actually turning this trash into money. Yeah. You know, they're turning it into, you know, a sustainable income opportunity, which is like. A very powerful thing mm-hmm. um, because when you just aid or if you just give that creates kind of a, an issue you know you can't just like only provide and then don't really provide like a way to sustain that so yeah you know they, they were able to kind of develop this process that basically allows for you know economic development and then through that you know a textile can be born and then you know a brand or designer like us can come in and then we can create uh, like a product that's desirable in the consumer market. Um, and then we can trace it all the way back, you know, basically to the first mile of the supply chain. And, you know, I also had a chance to w- walk through our factory, which is also in Haiti, you know, not too far from the landfill in Port-au-Prince. And, you know, we were able to see, um, you know, just all of the artisans that, you know, come from basically all over Haiti, uh, you know, just extremely talented, you know, yeah. extremely collaborative Um you know, we, we look forward to kind of showcasing more of, uh, you know, like just the stories of the individuals and the artisans that are working on our products and then even like other collaborators that we're, you know, in the works with now. Mm-hmm. Well, two things. One, I love Thread International and that is amazing that you guys work with them. Their work truly is amazing. I actually have been emailing back and forth to have them on the podcast um, because they really are. They're so, they're so amazing. I actually was connected to them through my fa- my friend, Bethany Tran um, from who is the founder of the root collective. Um, and Bethany ah. knows the, the folks from thread international. And it's funny because so many of the guests I have on this show all know Bethany, but Bethany's like one of my closest friends. So it's oh, just wow. so funny how I feel like every time I come, I have like so many guests that I'm like, so you and I met through Bethany. <laughs> like, yeah, um, no, that's super cool. Um, And then so talking about when you said you went to the landfill in Haiti. So I, um, I have been to Kenya three times and on my most recent trip to Kenya in January, we were taken to, um, our team was taken to the Dandora dump. And the Dandora dump is actually, it's the largest dump in Kenya. And it may be the largest dump in, it's definitely the largest dump in East Africa. It may even be the largest dump in Africa. But it, it it's definitely top two or three. Um, and it is basically right on the outskirts of downtown Nairobi. And it is connected like it's surrounded by slums on the outskirts Mm. of Nairobi and I was I knew we were going there um, but I don't think I was really prepared for what I was going to see 
Um, it's a it spans a little over thirty three acres, um, and it is the stench, like the smell of it, is just it like stings your nose. It's so bad. Doesn't go away for a while. It right? does not go away. Um, it is, and it's just like everything is just steaming, and it. You walk through there and there's just, I think the things, the things that were most shocking to me about it were, so as we walked through, um, you could see different areas for where different places around, because it, it collects all of the trash from Nairobi and the airport and then also like other surrounding um, basically like I guess municipalities I guess you could say um, but you could see like where different areas would dump so for example we were walking through and there was an area where you could see the hospital dump stuff because it was all these like empty pill packets mm. like just the little silver pieces you know when you pop a pill out yeah it's like I mean it was like thousands and thousands and thousands of empty pill packets wow. and then we would walk a little further and you would just see the outline of shoes in these big, giant rubber mats. So it was like these huge, huge, huge sheets of rubber that would have the holes of the outline of shoes. So you could see that this was like, I guess, rubber from a shoe factory where they were like stamping out the bottoms of shoes. And mm. it was just hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of these rubber mats with shoe cutouts. And then you'd walk a little further and you'd see um, you'd see the trays. <laughs> this one was like very timely at the time because we had just I mean, we'd just flown there and you could see the trays that you get when you get a meal on a plane. I believe it. And I was just to me, it was so jarring because I was like, these are things that I like I that could have been my tray from yesterday from my flight. Um, And so I started, you know, as we continued to walk, the thing that then hit me the most was, and this is, this is what, there's been a lot of documentaries and, and, or or I think there has been a documentary and then there's been a lot of news stories on this is the, there's a, there's basically a culture in the Dandora dump of people from the slums who, who essentially make their living in the dump. And what they do is, I mean, when we were there, I could see with my eyes probably close to a thousand people in there walking in and around. So there would be people when the dump trucks would come in, they would be dumping and you would just watch hundreds of people, men and boys first, like flock to the, um, the, the spot where the dump truck was dumping. And then they would be the first ones to try and pick out anything that they could hopefully sell. And then when the men and boys were done, the women and girls would go in and try and find anything that they could. And then basically what the pickers do is they go into the dump and they pick and try to find anything that they can possibly sell. Sometimes they will be in there with these large, large, large sacks. Like we saw this one woman who was carrying a sack that was bigger than she was and it was full. And so, but what they'll do is they'll they'll spend about between anywhere from 10 to 15 hours in the dump, picking, filling their sack, and then they go into the slums and try to sell it. And they can maybe, on a good day, make it most like $2 or $2.50 from what they collect. And it was just gut-wrenching. It was painful to watch. And it was also this moment of like, what do you do? Because there's, one, you have this dump that is horrible for their health. It's horrible for the environment. It's There's a lot of gang activity. There's a lot of really bad stuff that happens in there as well. Um, Oh, yeah. But then on the flip side, you also have people who literally survive and feed their families off this dump. So, like, what do you do? What do you do? It's just such a – and it. I think it was the first time that I really saw that the solution to poverty is not a black and white answer. Absolutely. And I think it's an effort that has to be – kind of cultivate it from sort of, you know, on the ground, you know, from uh, collaborating, you know, and that's why we knew, you know, we, we weren't going to be able to like 
do anything like by ourselves, like overnight. Like we knew this was going to be a long journey, a long process. Yeah. Um, but we have been fortunate to kind of partner up with organizations that have already, you know, started to make, you know, that, that transition and make things happen. So, you know, we were fortunate to um, be hosted by the Clinton Foundation when we went to Haiti. And, oh, you know, wow. they were actually able to kind of, you know, really give us this like lens into the country and to really, you know, connect with like all the different, for example, like the, the artisan, uh, kind of like the workshop owners. I mean, just to see all the, uh, places within fashion, within the artisanal sector and, uh, in the agriculture sectors, um, where, you know, you, you're really, your investment or kind of what you make a consumer decision on once you do get back in the States or wherever you are respectively around the world, it really kind of helps you get a view on it does make a difference, you know, yeah. making a, that conscious decision to support a company or a brand that, yeah. um, you know, is in an active position around that and kind of shows support for like, you know, labor or uh, just, you know, actually just caring. I mean, that's yes. really the the basic word for it, you know, that cares, you know, that really goes a long way. So lots of work to be done, uh, lots of products to be made. You know, this will be our first year on our end to produce, you know, this will be the first year that we'll produce just under about 5,000 units. So oh, wow. um, we started with hundreds of, um, you know, bags in the first year. And then after that, we you know, kind of ran out of runway, you know, we ran, we ran out of inventory, we, we sold through everything. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard when you're starting out, you're trying to be efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but what we really look forward to is, you know, kind of getting the products out there, because I think you're right. Everything is like an afterthought, especially around recycling, because yeah. you throw it away, and you don't see it again, right? You know, so it's hard to really picture, um, seeing you know this product that is made out of trash or made out of something that's been recycled right but once you once you actually see it um that makes uh it makes it hit harder you know it's like it's that experience of walking the dump or walking the landfills like it's not going to be the exact same but at least you can kind of see something that has been recreated or repurposed and then that makes you a little bit more conscious the next time you have to kind of make a decision uh whether that's a commerce decision or even just like a recycling decision yeah and it's funny because i've always been the people first type person like i i mean it's not that i don't care about the environment it's not that i don't care about animals i do i have two dogs i love dogs <laughs> you know i love i love our planet i think we should be good stewards of it but for me, it's always been about the people. It's, you know, I care about the people that make my stuff. And I want to know that they are paid a fair wage. I want to know that they have access to health care, that moms are able to, to work and see their families. I mean, I, I care about that stuff. That's stuff I'm really passionate about. Um, but it's, it's, it's been a really interesting journey as I've started learning more about this. And, and, and when I went to the dump, I've just been, my awareness has been that much more heightened to our impact on the environment and 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 just what things like fast fashion and just waste in general do to economies due to pe and due to people and I think that that's the first time that I ever really saw that impact was in the dump um, and so it it has really it, it's changed me a lot in a lot of the ways that I now like my own behaviors and so I think about these things a lot like. When I used to go through my closet or I used to go through my drawers and be cleaning stuff out, you know, I'd have the stuff that I'm going to sell or stuff I'm going to donate. And then I've got, you know, it, things that maybe just have a lot of holes in them. I would just throw away. And now, like, I have this giant box and bag of textiles that I need to take to a textile recycling center. There's only one or two near me that are – but they're, like, 30 minutes away – and my husband's like, why are you holding on to this stuff? And I'm like, because I'm taking it to a textile recycling place. Like, I'm not throwing it away. And um, and he kind of makes fun of me in a good way, like in a, in a loving jab kind of way. Um, <laughs> he makes fun of me that, like, I literally check everything now to see if it's recyclable. So, like, on – if I'm – opening up a packet of cheese, I look on the plastic to see it's, if it's recyclable. And I will, like, throw away in the recycling bin – 
tiny, tiny little pieces of plastic or, you know, uh, cardboard or whatever. And then whatever can't be recycled, I put in the trash or to see if I can like reuse it in some way. And he, he's always like, that's such a tiny piece. And I'm like, it adds up, it adds up. And so, and now I've made little switches. Like we now use reusable napkins at home instead of going out and buying paper napkins and little things like that. I've tried to, to make intentional decisions in our house so that we're making impact not only in our purchases, but also in our own behaviors of how we use things. Have you seen A Plastic Ocean, the documentary? No, I need to see that. Is it on Netflix? It is likely on Netflix by now. If not, probably a YouTube or maybe like even an iTunes type of thing. Yeah, I'm writing this I, down right now. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, because when you mentioned kind of the 30-minute drive to go and recycle your textiles, like I'm thinking if you kind of saw this documentary you you would i mean that's really where it starts and that's what it takes yeah um you know one of like the director you know he was in the film and he's going around to his local kind of grocery store and he's he's taking you know the initiative to like call on the manager and say you know what other alternatives do you have for plastic so that you know i can basically take my food home and um you know, so like, and he would leave the plastic in the in the grocery store, you know, like, yeah. and then just take like what he needed home with him and let them figure out what to do with the plastic. And, and I thought that that was just like this kind of very, you know, that's what it takes. It takes like disruption, you know, like yes. we have to, we have like, we do have to kind of go out of our way, you know, like even if it is slightly inconvenient, you know, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm 100% you know, I think that that's the way that it happens. I, I don't think that it's, I think it, it can come from the top down, but I think that we have to all, like, even from the bottom, like, as consumers, we have to inspire the big businesses to do it. We have to inspire the governments to do it. And yep. then it, it kind of will permeate, you know, but it, just like anything else, I mean, it's word of mouth. I mean, for our, like, even our brand, like, you know, it's it's word of mouth that gets us, yeah. you know, awareness, you know, we get, we were featured in fast company, Forbes, money magazine, Washington post. That was all like awareness from just what we had already been doing yeah. organically, you know, and like building our own community. So I, I think, I think you're right. I think, cause once you, once you tell someone else, you know, you'll, you'll build a community around that and, yep. you know, then they will introduce you to someone else. And then now you've got, you know, a group that's going and before you know it, you know, now it's something that, you know, it's being documented, et cetera. And, you know, that's how, I mean, that's how things start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was thinking about like even little things like 2017, I, I always have had those um, reusable grocery bags and I would always forget them. And so this year I made a like a promise to myself that I would keep them in my car at all times so that when I go grocery shopping, that I would have my reusable grocery bags and actually use them. And I've pretty much stuck to that. And so almost every time we go to the grocery store now, like I don't get grocery bags. So even the little things like that, like the plastic bags you get when you buy your groceries, that adds up. And so by just making those those changes in your own life, like that does, you were saying consumers, like consumers have so much power and they don't realize it. They don't realize how much companies pay attention to that stuff. Because when one person does it and then they impact another person and then that person impacts another person and that ripple effect happens, it really, really, really does add up. And companies listen because what do they listen to? They listen to money. <laughs> they see dollar signs. And so when their dollar signs start going elsewhere or they're spending more money on plastic bags that people aren't using, they pay attention to that. I mean, it's, it's so amazing. You know, I... We were fortunate to, to partner up with uh, one of the viewings uh, for A Plastic Ocean in Brooklyn, uh, New York. Yeah. Um, when it, like this was last year and to kind of, well, actually that was earlier this year. Everything's uh, kind of blending together. But, you know, you're right. That's And, and that's what, you know, the film kind of hit on was just exactly how, you know, it will make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. bottom line, you know, management will pay attention to that. Yeah. So it's... It's, you know, it, it may be painful at first or it may be a little bit inconvenient, but, you know, surely it's worth it. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess there's this misconception that it just has to be hard. And it yes. And it doesn't. And I and I I guess it's it, you know, for me, I would always forget, yes, sim- like something simple, like I would forget my reusable grocery bags in my house. But now, all I did was it took me maybe four minutes one time. I gathered all my reusable grocery bags around my house, and then I put a little bin in the back of my minivan. Yeah, I got a minivan because I'm awesome. There um, you go. <laughs> hey, minivan. Um, sliding doors, y'all. Sliding doors. Yeah. Um, so I put like this little bin in the back of my minivan. And I put my reusable grocery bags in there. And so that step of just putting a place in my car for my reusable grocery bags. And then when I go to the grocery store, I grab them. And then when I come home, I unload my groceries. And then I just put the bags right back in my van. And so it took all of four minutes to set it up originally. And now I don't even think about it. And so I think it's just, it's being intentional, but it doesn't have to be difficult. Exactly. I mean, it takes a little bit more planning. You know, at the end of the day, it's like I just ordered an electrical vehicle and there's very few kind of, you know, electrical vehicle charging stations uh, in our, you know, kind of area here. But with proper planning and research, you know, you can find them and you know, you can install them and yeah. you, you can find communities that are already engaged around that uh, kind of culture. So, yeah. you know, that's why I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. I think, you know, be the change that you want to happen, you know, mm-hmm. and that's how we got started with these bags. You know, we wanted to make the bag that we wanted to carry. We yeah. wanted to influence the future that we want to be a part of. And, you know, it just seems like in 2017 that, for most bags or apparel to just kind of not necessarily have a sustainable material behind it um, or, or even process is just, you know, you, you're thinking, and if you're us, you're thinking, well, it's kind of sad that that's the case, you know, like yeah. we've, we've sent people into space, you know, we've made iPhones, we've, yeah. we've done a lot <laughs> and, you know, we, we can't kind of get that piece, you know, um, done yet. So, that's what we, you know, that's our mission. That's what we're working on. You know, it doesn't, you know, and in our case, it doesn't necessarily cost much more than another brand. Um, our bags are, you know, right now $95. The shirts are 25 So, you know, there's bags that are $1,500. You know, there's bags that are $500. Um, you know, there's shirts that are $1,200. You know, yeah. shirts that are $120. Like, You know, we're not the most expensive thing on the rack, but I think the awareness and just kind of getting people to notice that, um, like you said, all these things are kind of a tie to it in in the product. And then, you know, kind of what that says about um, like what like what we like, I think that's a strong statement. Like if you vote, vote with your dollars, like that's how you really that's how you really show what your value system is. And, you know, I think there's a savvy group of people that are early adopters that already get that and they're already engaged. And I think we'll start to see a trend of more adoption, you know, from, you know, people that do want to help, they want to do something, but they Mm -hmm. just don't know how, you know, because, you know, we've all been there, you know, we want to do something, we're inspired, we want to help, but we just don't know how, we don't know what to do. So I think it's just that, that goes back to the brands and the companies to raise the awareness and the right profile around, you know, not just an initiative, not just like a one-off project, but like an entire ethos, like an entire uh, goal of a brand, like an entire objective. Like that's how I think it gets done. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that what you were saying just about, I guess you, so what you're going to see in the next couple of years, I've, I've been saying like, I really predict that over the next five, 10 years, we're going to see a shift in the way people consume and the way people um, throw away things similar to what we've seen in the previous five to 10 years with food. Like if you think about, you know, when I was in college, even just 15 years ago, when I was a freshman in college, like I don't think I really even knew what organic food was. Or, I mean, it just never, I don't, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I feel like organic was sort of this 
kind of strange thing that only like hippies used. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like it just wasn't, it wasn't. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then you've seen now, because as people have learned about sustainable farming and people have started learning about supporting your farmer and people have started learning about GMOs and whatever, you know, whatever your opinion is on that, but just, you know, there's now this, this movement of eating, food that's not processed and not filled with sugar and not filled with a bunch of junk and supporting farmers and supporting, um, you know, your local, you know, your local bakeries and things like that. Like people want to know what's in their food now. And so that movement has really been in the last five to 10 years. I feel like at least, at least since I've noticed. And then I I totally agree. Yeah. I think you're, I think what you're hitting on is like, the same thing that we work on every day is about kind of making something that was previously either didn't have the awareness or it just had not been branded as cool yet. Um, You know, like I get, you know, there's something called sun basket. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh yeah, I've heard of this. I've heard it's really awesome, but I have not tried it myself. You know, best farms to your table, I think is like the the tagline. But if you think about like just, the element of design and like how they like present the food. Like it's just, I mean, it makes it cool. Yeah. And you know, same here. Like, you know, I had a meal plan when I was in, you know, college. Yeah, it was me like, too. You know, it was all, all, it was like complete, it was like a food desert on campus. Like, yep. you know, literally like there was just all, you know, fast food. Like there was nothing really like healthy. So right. I think if you look at, you know, what we do now, like with kind of sustainable basics, the, the idea that most people have is like, oh, it's crafty or, you know, it's just not polished. It's like, it's a DIY type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like something that, you know, people really like get behind, but I think that's where the work comes in to actually get on the right distribution channels, you know, like being online, you know, that's why we're you know, we're podcasting, you know, because it's something to talk about. It's right. something to, to share the word about, to spread the message about and to, um, you know, ultimately, you know, it has to be like rebranded. So I think you're right. I think in the next few years, kind of consumption, conscious consumption will continue to evolve from a, from a, from a brand standpoint, just as a, just as an idea. And I think you'll see you know, like you said, I, th- I think you're going to see more uh, awareness brought to it. And I think that that's going to make it more um, irresistible where people are like, you know, look like you're not you're not taking a recycled grocery bag with you. Like, shame on you. Like, that's going to be. Yep. You know, that's going to be like part of the zeitgeist. Yep. I completely agree. Um, you saying you talking about Sun Basket and the farm to table thing, like reminded me. So every year. You know, there's this whole talk about, you know, should people be vegetarians and should people be vegans and the way our animals are treated and yada, yada, yada. And for me, like it goes about just it's back to what you were saying, like knowing thy farmer and knowing um, knowing where your your stuff's coming from. So I'm, this is timely because we just got a new one. But um, the last two years, my husband and I, we buy a cow every summer. <laughs> Oh my um, gosh! And I mean, it's not alive when <laughs> it, it's alive when we buy it. <laughs> it's not alive when it comes to our house. So sure. sorry for you cow lovers out there, but they're delicious. Um, and <laughs> but it's from this this farm up in Yanceyville, which is probably about fifty minutes north of us, or kind of northwest, I guess. And it's this bald Baldwin farm. He's been a beef a cattle farmer for. Uh, years I mean a long time and when we went last year for the first time to pick it up like you you buy the cow they um you can tell them how you want it butchered and everything and then you literally go and you pick it up and it's everything is already cut and prepped for you and it's flash frozen and and when we rolled up to the farm I mean it's in this beautiful part of the country like just rolling hills and just beautiful part of North Carolina and we roll up and like old V Mac Baldwin like the farmer he walks out and he's like hey yep. there I'm V Mac Baldwin the original V Mac like and he's just like <laughs> y'all here to pick up your cow you know like so he just and he's helping us load it in the truck and um and you know yeah it's not it's not pretty like we're picking up frozen beef in you know some old apple boxes or whatever you know that whatever 
but and we put it in the deep freezer in our fridge, but like or in our um, garage. But I mean, that beef is I know exactly where it was. I know exactly where it came from. I know exactly how it was raised. I know what it was fed. I know who owned it. And I know how it was butchered. I, I know everything about it. And it's delicious. <laughs> um, and I, I don't feel bad when I'm eating it. Do you know what I mean? And, and I realize this is a very kind of strange, extreme example. But I think that now that, you know, I've had the chance to, you know, meet some of the people that own some of these ethical businesses. And I know they're artisans. And I've seen, I, you know, I, I've been to Kenya and I've seen, um, I've met some of the artisans that make some of the goods that I buy. I've seen where they live. I've seen their families. I've seen how they make it. And that, that changes you. It changes the way you see things because it's no longer a faceless, nameless thing. It's really powerful when you start putting, you know, a face to a name or uh, tracing, you know, going back to, you know, a supply chain, like the beginning of a supply chain. Like, I think you're I think you're spot on. It it really does change things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I am so excited for just to see you guys continue to grow. I it's funny cuz I first I remember seeing your Kickstarter last year. So oh, wow. it's been really cool to kind of see, you know, just <laughs> a little bit from afar. And and I think I probably saw it because I'm, you know, this is a space that I spend a lot of time in, so I I kind of watch for new companies to pop up and I and when I see a company and I um I want to learn more about them. And I've just loved seeing what you guys have done from the beginning and, and how. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I, I just think the, the product you make is awesome. It's, it's cool. Like you were saying, like it, we want it to be cool. Like it is cool. It looks awesome. It's a great, um, it's a great product for men and women. Um, I think it's, you know, you know, the bags are, I'd say, Maybe on the more masculine side of gender neutral, but I mean, I think honestly, like I, I love them. Like I would use one. Um, I think the apparel is an awesome next step for you guys. So I'm really excited just to continue to watch you guys grow and the impact that you guys are going to make and, and how you're going to continue to, to spread the message to other companies so that they can start stepping up and making similar changes um, or make improvements. You know what I mean? I just, I look forward to kind of seeing the growth and, and the impact that it has on just our culture in general. Um, but I'd love for you to just kind of share what's on the horizon for Hamilton Perkins and, uh, what is sort of your next goal and what are you looking forward to as we're in the second half of 2017? And as we start to think about 2018, which is a little crazy to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Fall, fall, winter 2017 is, you know, basically here for us. We're, you know, in the middle of production now. We're, we're sample making, we're, we're sailing pr- uh, parts, you know, we're getting, getting, you know, really getting down to almost what we would consider crunch time uh, to start, you know, really having enough of the inventory that we need for uh, Black Friday and, you know, holiday season and, you know, even into like the earlier parts of, uh, 2018 but mm-hmm. i think for you know spring summer 2018 and even even a little bit before that i think you know fans of our brand followers of our brand are going to be really excited customers of our brand are really going to be excited to see uh that we're coming out with new products uh you know new accessories you know like you said expanding into apparel uh you know slowly introducing new colors you know efficiently without waste um and you know we want you to try out what we do have you know we do have bags and shirts available at hamiltonperkins.com molly we have brought a discount code on for you so that anyone of your listeners or audience that wants to check us out uh, can do so and get ten dollars off the first order at checkout Uh, so if you just enter uh, purpose uh, just all spelled out um, you will get ten dollars off the first order and leave us a review let us know what your thoughts are we you know we'd love to uh we we always 
enjoy feedback and love to learn, uh, you know, from customers or uh, potential customers of our brand. Okay, guys. So definitely, like I said, check them out, support them, use the code purpose for $10 off. And um, Hamilton, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was such a, it, it was a pl- truly a pleasure to talk with you. And I hope to have you back on the show um, again someday to share just all the things that you guys are continuing to do and how you've grown and, and, and the things you've learned and all of that. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And when we get our uh, podcast up and running, we you know, we have to get you on if you'll be up for it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Count me <laughs> in for sure. Man, I could hang out with Hamilton all year long. That guy is so awesome. And I really love how he gave some tangible examples on things that we can do as consumers to make a difference, not only on impacting the environment in a positive way, but also people. As you guys know, people first for me. I love making sure that people are taken care of. And I just love the heart behind Hamilton's business. And also for you guys, there is a special code that you guys can use just for my listeners. You can use the code PURPOSE for $10 off your order from Hamilton Perkins. So go check them out, support them. Use that coupon code PURPOSE for $10 off your order. They would make great gifts for so many different people in your life this holiday season or really any time. So definitely check them out. And thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you're a first-time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for all the past shows featuring so many amazing business owners. And if you're a regular listener of the show, thank you for tuning in week in and week out. And thank you for your support. Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure you are subscribed to the show. Clicking that subscribe button helps to ensure that you never miss a new episode of the show. And while you're there, would you mind taking a moment to just leave a review of the show? Leaving a review of the show helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. Reviews also help to show other potential listeners what the show's really about. And if you share the show on social media, be sure to use the hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast or tag me at Still Being Molly on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anything like that. This show is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman, and the music is by Mark Killian of Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose.